Well, good morning, everyone. So great to have you with us. Vintage Online, a very, very warm welcome. Can I just say before we do anything else, we miss you. I cannot wait for the day when we are all together again. Miss so many faces. Long for the day when we can hug it out and worship together as the family of God. We're continuing this week on our series in the Gospel of Matthew, and it's my great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker this morning, Dr. Amy Orr Ewing. She's the president of the Oxford Centre for Christian Apologetics. She's a best-selling author who's just written a book on the subject of suffering. She's an incredible speaker, and it's a joy and privilege to have her with us. She'll be speaking on sickness, suffering, and healing from Matthew chapter 8. So it's exciting exciting to have her with us. Before we do anything else, I'd love to read a scripture over us and pray as we step into um, this morning's service. John says these words in the book of Revelation, words of deep hope. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. I am making everything new. Let's take a moment to pause and pray. Lord, we are acutely aware that we are in a world of suffering and sickness. We are in a world of all sorts of darkness and brokenness, but we are also aware that you are making everything new. We ask you, Lord, to fill us with your healing presence. Open our ears to hear what you have to tell us this morning. We pray this in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. Let's worship God. Jesus. 
Jesus, there's nothing impossible for Yeah, we believe. When all I see are the ashes, you see the beauty. So, Father, thank you for this morning that we can spend it together, God. And I thank you for your presence with us. And thank you that what this song says is true, that the battle truly does belong to you. So we could bring all of our fears, we could bring all of our worries to you, God, knowing that you go before us, that you stand behind us. So we just welcome you into this service, into our homes, and we just say we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, welcome again to our online service. My name is Max, and I'm the worship director here at Vintage Church. I hope you're well, and I do hope that you've been enjoying worshiping with us online. I know that it's been such a crazy season with so many changes. Uh, but the one amazing part about this whole thing has been that we have never stopped worshiping, which is absolutely incredible. I remember when the lockdown first happened and I texted our whole worship team and was like, hey, let's rush to church, let's start recording some worship. And everybody came immediately. And I think the reason was, is that we wanted to be a church that never stopped worshiping. So from that moment when we were recording in the sanctuary to when we started recording via Zoom, and then we started doing some Instagram things, and now we've built this incredible studio where we get to worship from. But it was all with a heart for us to continually be anchored in the presence of God. I think about Moses when the Lord tells him, Moses, go ahead, you can take the land, go to the promised land. And he said, Lord, if you do not go with us, 
we will not go. And I think Moses just realized that the ultimate prize was not the promised land. It was actually God himself. And so while we find ourselves in this seeming wilderness, my prayer is that we realize the same thing, that he is the great prize, and that in and through every season, he is worthy of worship, he is worthy of praise. And the incredible part about that is he is a generous giver. So he fills us with his peace, with his love, with his courage that we need for the coming days. So I do just wanna encourage you, continue worshiping with us, whether it's online, Instagram, or anywhere else. Let's continue to be a people who gather, lift up the mighty name of Jesus, and that abide in his presence. I also want to take a moment to give an exciting update, and that is that our Kingdom Come Nights are back. I know many of you are excited for that. I'm really excited for it. And if you're new to Vintage and you don't know what Kingdom Come is, Kingdom Come is a two-hour worship night that we do here at Vintage. We do it about once a month, and we just did the last one in September. Now we're doing it in October. So October 29th, 7 to 9 p.m. is the date. And I believe that the in-person tickets are now sold out. However, you can check on the wait list. And I know many people drop out, so you can still get a ticket that way. But if you can't join us in person, you can still join us online. We will be live streaming. There will be a link sent out. And I do hope that we continue to gather as a church, as we just make space for the presence of God to move in us and through us. We will be abiding for the in-person gathering with all of the safety procedures of wearing masks and social distancing. And we did that for the last one. And I gotta say, it was more powerful than ever before. I know I was wondering, oh no, what's it gonna be like? But as soon as we started worshiping, the presence of God just filled the room. And I'm sure that it filled every home of every person tuning in. So do join us online, sign up, and let's continue worshiping together as a family. Hi, Vintage family. We have so many things that we can be praying for during this season, and it can really be anything, anything on your heart or mind, whether personal prayers, prayers for family or friends, or for the world. The Bible encourages us to pray for all things and at all times. In Ephesians 6, 18, it says, pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. And we're gonna do just that this morning. So let's come together as a family and pray. First of all, let's give thanks to the Lord for all that he is, for his enduring love for us, for his promise to always be near to us and to always provide for our needs. for those that are suffering within our community. Let's pray for those that are going through financial crisis right now. Let's pray for provision for them. Let's pray, pray for protection for those that are suffering in homelessness. Let's also pray for those that are going through relational struggles. Let's pray for healing. Let's pray for physical healing, emotional healing, and for God to heal our land.
Father, we love you so much. Thank you for your love that is ever present, that every day you smile upon us with the most beautiful smile. Thank you for the ways that you provide for us, that your care is so deep and so perfect for us. Thank you for the promise that you will never leave us in any situation, that you will always be right by our side because you delight in us so much. We pray for those that are suffering within our community. We pray that they know how much they are loved and adored by you. We pray for provision and protection of the stresses of this world and for those experiencing financial stress, homelessness, and relational struggles. We pray that your hope breaks through in every circumstance. And Lord, we pray that your power of healing is felt by all. We pray over physical, emotional pain, and your healing covers our city, our country, and our world. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Hello, it's Amy or Ewing here in Oxford, and it's a real privilege and delight to join you today as we consider together um, the question of suffering and where God might be in the midst of this suffering world. In 2016, um, one of the most vibrant and dynamic people I've ever met, Nabil Qureshi, was diagnosed with terminal stomach cancer. He was 34, he stood over six feet tall, he was a person of enormous energy and huge capacity and stamina for teaching and international travel, engaging in conversation with the people who came to hear him speak. And he was doing that whilst also studying here at Oxford at the university here for his postgraduate degree. And he was also the father of a, a toddler. Nabil was the best-selling author of the New York Times bestseller, Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus, in which he tells his story, amazing story of changing his mind from his birth religion of Islam and actually encountering Christ. And he was enormously fun and intellectually curious. And so when, as his friends and colleagues, we heard of his diagnosis, we just couldn't believe it. How could someone so alive, someone um, being so powerfully used by God, someone so young, have stage four stomach cancer? Three months before he died, um, I had lunch with him and we talked about all sorts of things. At that point, he was struggling with the physical pain of his illness. But more than that, the, the realisation, the pain of the realisation that he was going to be most likely um, leaving behind his beloved wife, Michelle, and his um, precious daughter, Aya, that he wouldn't see her growing up. Well, today, as we consider the question, where is God um, in the suffering of the world, and particularly the qu that question of physical illness, I want us to do that, not in the abstract, not just thinking about this as a sort of theoretical question, but bearing in mind that this question is real. We all know people who've, who've died young, who've experienced um, the devastating loss of a, of a terminal diagnosis. And so we're left with the question, why does nature go wrong? And where is God when illness strikes? Surely a loving God would not allow um, this kind of suffering in the world. And why would he allow a fervent follower of his in his 30s to die in this kind of way? Now, sometimes serious illness can bring about real doubts in the hearts of people who, who love God fervently let alone people who scarcely believe that God even exists. And a powerful example of this is actually found in John's Gospel in chapter 11, where one particular a family who'd been close friends of Jesus had this exact experience of their faith being shaken by someone um, becoming ill and dying. Um, Jesus has a friend called Lazarus, and when this friend Lazarus dies, Jesus actually weeps at the tomb of his friend, the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. 
But Lazarus also had two sisters and this family loved each other very dearly and deeply. So when Lazarus, their brother, dies of an illness, the sister, Mary in particular, is so upset and she's upset with Jesus for not coming soon enough to heal her brother. She says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. In other words, the illness and death of her brother causes Mary to doubt God. She's asking, where were you when this happened, Jesus? And she's alleging, if you really loved us, you would have been here in such a way that this would not have happened. Now, when a similar thing happens to many of us, we lose a loved one or we receive a terminal diagnosis. Uh, uh, we're afflicted by an illness in this way, it's actually really natural to ask this question, God, if you were here, if you were real, this wouldn't be happening. So are you here and are you real? And I think the very fact that this question is in the Bible and it is directly posed to Jesus actually acknowledges what many of us experience we will struggle to reconcile the reality of cancer, chronic illness, impairment from an accident, the onset of a degenerative disease, and many more experiences of illness and pain. We're gonna to struggle to reconcile that with the existence and presence of a God who loves us. So if a God exists who is loving, why does our health go wrong? Why do we battle cancer, diabetes, coughs and colds, infections, coronavirus, other health niggles? And how does the Christian faith reconcile its claims of a loving God with the painful illness and death of people around whilst all the while claiming God loves them? So as you may know, the Bible actually begins with a description of a loving and intelligent creator as the instigator and the maker of a beautiful and good world. And as Genesis unfolds, the writer describes how the possibility of loving relationships between human beings and between human beings and God requires that a genuine capacity for decision-making exists. In other words, true love cannot be forced. God creates a beautiful, moral and ordered universe and he creates human beings as those who bear his image within that universe and who have the capacity to love and to choose. But as human beings, we have decided to fracture that order by seeking not to love God, but instead to deny his authority over creation and to live as rulers ourselves. Genesis 3 describes this. God has made clear the consequences of that decision, that death and thorns and thistles and disease and disagreement and heartbreak and pain enter the world as a result of our exercise of moral choice. And as human beings now, we live, if you like, in the downstream of that original decision of the first humans in Genesis 3, in the broken world, and um, uh, all the consequences that have followed from there. But we also contribute to that brokenness with our own decisions, not to love others well and not to love God at all. So once our selfishness has a foot in the door in Genesis 3, the negative effects of that accelerate and increase. And we see that through the book of Genesis until the direct connection between a particular moral choice and the impact of negative moral behaviour upon the very fabric of life is all but lost. And so whoever we are, whatever the particular decisions we may or may not have made, whether good or bad, we are all affected by this breakdown and by the disease and decay in our world. So according to the Bible, our general human experience of disease is actually unaffected by our specific moral behaviour. And it's even unaffected by our belief system. So a diagnosis of cancer is not 
a, a, a direct result of believing the wrong thing or of doing a particular thing wrong. It's a result of living in a fallen world. So whether we believe in God or not, every single one of us lives in that fallen world and we all experience the legacy of choices made by other human beings reinforced over multiple generations as well as our own cycles of dysfunction and selfishness. So the loving God who made a world in which love is possible did not choose to destroy or discard us, sort of hitting a reset button on creation. So our continued existence in a world of pain and suffering um, actually is explained by the Bible. It's not in contradiction to the Bible. But does that mean that God just doesn't care? That he's just left us? Not at all. The Bible repeatedly claims that God does care and that he does not ignore or abandon us. So let's think for a moment about physical suffering and disease. You see, I want to ask a bigger picture question for a moment. Whether we believe in God or not, all of us are affected by disease and death. But I want to ask the question, why do these things hurt so much? And what does what I believe about the origins of life and whether or not there is a God have to say about suffering and disease and death and why it matters to us all? Uh, my twins just turned 15 um, yesterday. But when they were born, um, I became friends with a woman whose son was born a few days before them. And those exhausting days and months of having newborn babies and looking after toddlers are sort of hazy memory in some ways. But this particular friend did all of that whilst also coping with a chronic health condition of her own. The day in and day out sort of grind of exhaustion that we all experience when we have, if we have small children was exacerbated for her by the constant pain that she was in. And yet somehow she continued to care for her child. I don't know how she did it. She was one of the most patient people I've ever met. A couple of years ago, I injured my back and I was diagnosed with two herniated discs and a compressed nerve. I was housebound for five weeks. I was unable to drive. Um, I actually couldn't sleep because of the absolutely excruciating constant pain. And I often thought about my friend and I realised that I had had no idea with what she had coped with and with what her daily life experience had been, I began to realise that chronic illness, like other kinds of diagnosis, has a profound effect on us as people. Physical illness and wounds inflict something much deeper on a person and on their loved ones than just the brute fact of the torn flesh, the raised temperature, the immobility, or even the bruises and cuts. There's a deep effect of cumulative physical pain that somehow begins to seep into the core of who we are. But why is that? Why should physical frailty in our bodies hurt us at this almost transcendent level? Does our human experience of illness actually serve as a reminder and an indicator that to be human is to be more than a material physical entity of molecules and atoms? A Hebrew poet writing 3,000 years ago put the sacred agony of illness into words that have comforted millions of people through the ages. He said this, hear my prayer, Lord, let my cry for help come to you. Do not hide your face from me, I'm in distress. Turn your ear to me when I call. Answer me quickly for my days vanish like smoke. My bones burn like glowing embers. My heart is blighted and withered like grass. I forget to eat my food. In my distress, I groan aloud. I'm reduced to skin 
and bones. That's Psalm 102. You see, lament over illness is given voice in the Bible. Disease and death hurt us at the level of our most essential being because there is a connection between the real me, who I actually am, and my physical body. Suffering from illness has a deeper meaning than just the mere physical experience of pain, and that is because our lives are created and are sacred in some way. We are more than just the material stuff of our bodies. In my family, this was brought home to me, um, especially powerfully through seeing my stepmother-in-law experience breast cancer. For any women, um, receiving a diagnosis of breast, breast cancer is very um, chilling. And given how widespread this disease is, most of us will know someone who has either died from this or um, uh, been diagnosed with it. And obviously the location in the female body of this cancer seems to evoke a specific kind of dread for a woman. Fleur, my stepmother-in-law, was beautifully brave and resilient and funny and hospitable even as cancer ravaged her body. And it wasn't just the physical pain of the illness that distressed her, it was the thought of the pain being inflicted on her daughters and her husband, who she was going to leave behind. The acute pain of loss and separation that was coming loomed larger even as the physical pain intensified. But there was also something almost sacred in that pain, the holding on to life even as death crept up on us. It seemed to all of us that God was actually truly and really present with us. One evening together as a family in her bedroom, we shared Holy Communion, that symbolic meal of bread and wine symbolising the crucifixion of Jesus, the bread representing his body, the wine representing his blood, those physical symbols taken into our bodies, into our physical bodies, pointed us to a life beyond the grave. Pain is real. The pain and experience of injury and physical suffering are devastating, but I think they point us to the profound sacredness and value of life. They hurt so much because human pain is more than merely physical. Is it enough to face death and rage and rage against the dying of the light, as the poet put it? Or is there more to human existence? Is there more life in me beyond my body? Do illness and pain hurt this much because we as human beings are made in the image of God? We were made to live. I think that we were created for life both in and beyond our physical bodies here and now. And it is Jesus Christ who uniquely makes sense of that. Where is God in our experiences of physical illness? Well, if pain is the cost of love, our physical pain and illness is a consequence of living in this world where choices are made and love is possible. But in that darkest agony of physical pain, God has not left us to suffer alone. In fact, this question has caused Christians to agonise and to pray and to rage against God. But it's also caused us to care and to show love um, to others. Since the very first days of the early church, Christians in every generation have been inspired to work with the dying. In the 1990s, I got to visit Mother Teresa's home for the dying. She was known for her work in Calcutta in India for caring for the destitute and being determined that every person be given a dignified death. It was a truly moving experience um, to visit those sisters and to see how they poured the love of Christ out in that kind of context. 
But I think we're also left with the question, where does healing fit into all of this? Where is God in this suffering world? And does he actually heal today? In Matthew um, chapter 8, which is um, a reading for today, verses 1 to 13, Jesus heals a man with leprosy. And the man says, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus says, I am willing. And then it goes on that there's a centurion servant and he's ill. And then the centurion says to Jesus, say the word and my servant will be healed. And Jesus says, go, it will be done just as you believed it would. Two accounts in just 13 verses of Matthew's gospel of astonishing, miraculous physical healings. So Christians have wrestled with this dilemma. Does God heal? And if he can, then why wouldn't he always do it? If he doesn't heal, does that mean that he doesn't really exist? Or um, does it mean that he isn't really loving? There's a kind of theological context to this question. So we think about this suffering world and whether a loving God exists. And then we wonder, why does he heal some people and not others? So there seems in the New Testament to be a tension with regard, re, regard to God's miraculous actions. Um, and there's this term, now and not yet. You see, Jesus talked a lot about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. It was a phrase that he used to explain um, that he'd come into this world to bring God's kingdom, to demonstrate the goodness and the, good, the, the truth and the reality of God on earth. That's what the kingdom really means. And those who place themselves under God's loving rule begin to experience life in the kingdom, free from sin, free from suffering, free from oppression, free from poverty, pain and death. That's what the kingdom looks like. And Jesus demonstrates this truth in the miracles that he performed, healing the sick, casting out demons and raising the dead. And Jesus speaks about the kingdom as having come in his person. He says the kingdom of God is within you. And this means something practical and physical. The blind receive sight. Good news is proclaimed to the poor. He speaks about the kingdom being present and he speaks about the kingdom being something as yet to come. Jesus claimed this is something that will fully come when he returns. There will be a final judgment. There will be a new heaven and a new earth when all suffering will end and tears will be wiped from our eyes. So the miraculous interventions and healings that Jesus performs back then in the Gospels and still today demonstrate that he is God's chosen king bringing this kingdom. The centurion's servant being healed, the man being healed of lepros leprosy, the experiences of healing that you and I have seen in our lives today are signs pointing us toward the certainty of that future reality of the kingdom. It is now and it is coming. Now, a miracle of healing is only a miracle if it's unusual. In the Bible, the usual laws of nature hold. People die. Um, people experience the law of gravity. Miracles are seen and described as unusual interventions, signs pointing beyond themselves to something other, something greater, helping us realise that a God actually exists and he's intervening now to show us what his kingdom is like. In some senses, we can recognise a miracle and its message precisely because it is not ordinary. Miracles in the Bible are not sort of deserved badges of God's special favouritism for an individual who is healed or helped. And they're not rewards for good behaviour. They are visible signs of grace and goodness, signs of hope by which everyone who sees them can conclude that the king of this kingdom that is coming is real and that the future bliss that Jesus spoke of is really going to happen. 
14 years ago, um, I visited a member of my um, congregation who was in hospital dying of an aggressive cancer. He was a senior government official. He was doing amazing work. He had a family. He had a strong Christian faith and everyone in our church was devastated at his illness. We longed for God to heal him and um, we felt quite hopeless really in the face of his terminal diagnosis. But as my husband and I went into that hosp hospital room to pray for him, he said to us, a miracle is God's to give, not mine to demand. This humble, godly man actually did experience a, a, an amazing miracle against every miracle pre medical prediction. Um, he had further years given to him to work, but then he did die a few years later peacefully with his family around him. I found his um, attitude towards a miracle of healing to be profoundly moving. In my pain, in my illness, does God care? In contrast to other belief systems, Christian faith says yes. We do not worship a God who has a sort of law of karma, you get what you deserve. We worship a God who does exist and who does care. We're not at the whim of karma. We're not at the whim of a malevolent God um, in a far distant uh, sort of plane looking at us and kind of pulling the strings in a, in a fatalistic way. We encounter a loving God who's actually prepared to enter human history in Jesus and to suffer with us and for us. His love for us in our suffering is knowable and tangible because he has suffered. The famous author, um, she wrote detective fiction and, and other books. She was a friend of C.S. Lewis. Dorothy L. Sayers wrote this. She said, for whatever reason, God chose to make man as he is, limited and suffering and subject to sorrows and death. He had the honesty and courage to take his own medicine. What a get, whatever game he's playing with his creation, he's kept his own rules and played fair. He can exact nothing from man that he has not exacted from himself. He has himself gone through the whole of human experience from the trivial irritations of family life and the cramping restrictions of hard work and lack of money to the worst horrors of pain, humiliation, defeat, despair and death. When he was a man, he played the man. He was born in poverty and died in disgrace and he thought it well worthwhile. In Jesus, God has experienced pain for our sake. He considered it worth the cost. And so in some sense, our pain as human beings, our experience of suffering and illness is dignified by his willingness to step into it. Whatever else our pain may entail, we are not cosmically alone in it. And our pain is not futile or banal or meaningless. If we open ourselves to the possibility of a living, loving, suffering God, we can encounter him even in the midst of our pain. And the same Jesus who healed the leper and the centurion's servant heals today as a sign of the truth that that coming kingdom is real. The centurion just came to Jesus asking him for help. And I think that's something that we can do right now. Trusting him, coming to him for help in the midst of our pain and suffering. So why don't we do that right now as we pray? I'm going to pray for us. And so wherever you are, why don't you just open your heart to God and invite him, the God who was prepared to suffer, the God who made this world to be a world within which love is possible, who understands our brokenness, who understands our experiences of illness and invite him into those, those experiences. So God, we open our hearts to you right now. 
I want to pray for anyone um, watching this who's struggling with illness, with suffering. And just like that centurion came to you, Lord Jesus, and asked you for help, that's what we do today. We ask for your help and your healing. We ask for your help and your presence and your comfort to meet us in this suffering world. In your name, amen. Can go back to the beginning. Can control what tomorrow will bring. But I know here in the middle is the place where you promised to be.
every day He walks beside us And not for a minute Was I forsaken The Lord is in this place The Lord is in this place Come Holy Spirit Your goodness is running out, it's running out 
In a moment, the blessing, but before that, can I please encourage you, if for any reason you find yourself in a season of sickness or suffering, persevere in prayer, reach out to the family of God, reach out to us as a church, we would love to pray for you. We have prayer appointments during the week and pastoral appointments, so please don't be in it alone. In a moment, a slide's gonna come up, where we can give an opportunity to give to our church. And now the blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look kindly upon you and fill you with his peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you now and always. Amen. All that 